Hello, I'm Chuck. Frank Chi, who just directed the, the movie you just saw, the film you just saw. And Lance Edmonds, who did uh, Mr. Suck Alexis. Um, look, it's pretty obvious what these two films have in common. Stereotyping. Um, and, you know, Frank, I want to start with you. It, 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 the last five minutes of the short is what it, you needed the last five minutes. Absolutely. To truly, so that those of us that aren't Asian could be in your shoes, could be in the shoes of an Asian American and what that, what that felt like. I'll be honest with you, I think how much of Jeremy Lin's career was actually cut short by how he was treated in high school and how he was treated in college. I'm curious uh, how much you thought about exploring that. Um, so the way I always thought about Lin's sanity as a phenomenon is that it's a product of underestimating him, right? right? Like Jeremy had a nine-year career in the NBA, had a lot of valleys, a lot of valleys. But I think for him, the idea of exploding onto the scene like this was because he was the California State Player of the Year. He won the champion, state championship. And he got zero recruitment offers, right? He goes to Harvard. He averages There's a lot of schools in California. I mean, I mean forget <laughs> Harvard. Forget MIT. I was sitting there. There's a lot of colleges in the state of California. I mean, I, not one of them thought about bringing Ian Mountain as a point guard? I did not do the research on this, but I can't imagine that any other player that won those accolades did not get a scholarship offer, right? Like, I think he's probably the only one. And he goes to Harvard, he's three-time all Ivy League, he's 18 points a game. I mean, we put the draft notes in there. I mean, they just read like Asian stereotypes, right? So, you, I mean, <laughs> the only reason why he's in the league is because Joe Lacob is like, oh, I don't see you stereotypically because you played against my son when he Imagine was Imagine if up. he doesn't own the Warriors. Exactly, yeah. right? I mean, and like no. that's, like it's something that we, we cover in the film, but like you've really got to think about just how by chance that feels, right? And that's the reason, like, it's a series of, like, cracks in the wall of stereotypes that he had to confront in order for him to even be here. And I think- And he still probably didn't have the NBA career. I mean, imagine him with Coach K. Yeah. Imagine him two or three years in Kansas. And, you know, and, he, and he's drafted in the NBA, and then he's, and he's given, the, given the, the support system that Zion Williamson has. Right? You know, <laughs> Jeremy talks about this pretty honestly, and I'll, I'll be real with you, because I didn't know him before we did this project, and I just always assumed that somebody who was a symbol like that understood how I felt, right? I never reconciled the symbol with the human being. And I feel like we do, all of us do that when we really admire somebody. And he ran away from this story for a really long time. You know, he was like, you know, I was just trying to survive. You know, he was coming from a scarcity mindset about whether he was even Locks deserving to be the lead. always ticking when you're an athlete. Like exactly, that, exactly. Because your age is, every, every day you've lost another day to right. do what you dream of doing. Exactly. And I think for, for him, it only, I mean, he's towards the end of his career now. He's looking back at some of these things. He tried to run away from insanity for such a long time. But he, I think he realizes just how much it means to people, and especially to have that as like a example now, which is why we tie it in at the end to anti-Asian violence. Because if I were to describe 30 of the Garden without any basketball, I would say part one is about stereotypes. Part two is about what happens when someone shatters those stereotypes on the world stage. And part three is about today when those stereotypes are weaponized. And when they're weaponized, they turn into anti-Asian violence. It's pretty easy to understand. Now. All the kids who go to school these days, I mean, you go to school, you want to learn, you want to dream, you want to achieve. But if you're terrified to go to school because you don't want to be called China virus or Kung flu, yeah. like, you don't have the permission to dream. Look, I'll be honest, I did not think about the mask issue like yeah. that until it was every Asian parent is double masking their kid because they don't, I mean, it... It was, it was just a powerful statement. And look, it was rough for me when I was a kid growing up in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And none of those stereotypes have been weaponized. And I just, I couldn't, you know, we, we screened this, so we premiered a Tribeca and we screened uh, one of the screenings with the Knicks. And towards the end of the movie, during the really hard hitting part, 
there's this like little kid, he's like 10 years old. He's sitting near the front, he's weeping. Wow. And you're sitting, look, I don't know what you were like when you were 10. I, there was no movie that could make me cry. I was sort of an idiot, right? Like, so what, do you, what have you experienced the last couple of years that makes you cry like that? That, it made me realize that like that was actually our unintentional audience. I thought we were making like a millennial nostalgia movie. No. Right? Uh, it actually yeah, turned out to be a movie for important. kids. No offense, but it's a little more important. Exactly. <laughs> Lance, um, I couldn't help but watching this story of Sock Alexis and thinking, boy, if his, if his career isn't cut short, do we not have a color barrier in baseball? Yeah, that that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe that the racism that he experienced did cut his career short. I, I think it's um, pretty pretty straightforward that, that that's kind of what happened um, and that the way it's pretty clear what may have driven him to drink right yeah was how he was treated yeah and I and I think that um, you know that's really kind of an important part of his story is what he what he could have been and you know he was on a team with Cy Young who you know is one of the most famous baseball players of all time and he was as good if not better than some of these players when he was playing as a rookie and because he was the first and because he had to fit into this world and this, this sport and this community that was not like him, I, I think it, it really taxed him. He had to deal with so much that the other players didn't have to deal with. And I'm on sort of shocked that. that Holy Cross accepted him. Yeah, I mean... Did you delve into that? I mean, like, was this just... It was it, was it a controversial thing at the time for it, the community? It, it didn't it didn't seem like it was really. Um, I think that there was um, it was an opportunity for him to leave, leave the reservation, get an education, like he said. But I don't believe it was really um, controversial within that um, within the college mm -hmm. that he that he was accepted. Um, college baseball at the time was probably as big as the majors right. at the time, almost bigger in some respects. Most so, of the college sports were college football was much bigger than yeah. pro, pro football, um, right? So that, that team was a really big deal, um, mm -hmm. you know, that he was on for Holy Cross. So how'd you, um, what made you decide to do it? Obviously the name change brought him back. Did you know his story? I'll be honest, I consider myself a really pretty smart baseball fan. I didn't know the story. Yeah. Well, and the, so I'm really glad you did it. Yeah, that's part of part of it. Um, I grew up in Maine, where Sock Lexus is from, and I'm a huge fan of baseball myself and, and his, the history of baseball. And I was researching a different film about a totally different subject that had to do with the timber industry at the turn of the century, and his name came up because he was a he was a logger and he died uh, in the woods. And I was just so shocked that here was this incredible player, groundbreaking player, amazing player, really interesting story, impactful, 100 years later. And I didn't know very much about him. Um, and I was really, really interested to learn more. And there's a couple books that were written about him. I mm -hmm. snapped those up and read them cover to cover right away. And I just thought, this is a story that um, needs to be told. And as I was reading those books, and as I was exploring, is there a film here? Is there something about this player? That's when uh, Cleveland came out and announced that they would that it would be the la their last season. So you were researching the this, and then the they they officially made the name change. Yeah, and at that point I knew well this is now's the time to sure. tell to tell this story and to recontextualize his career n in light of you know. He was really just this historical footnote. Oh, the Indians are named after this guy, you know. Well, why didn't the, did you explore uh, uh, why the Cleveland franchise didn't, they could have wrapped themselves into this story and dealt right. with some of the criticism they were getting. It, it, this was a more, put it this way, it put the whole name issue in a more complicated light. And I'm just surprised the franchise didn't at least try to own the ownership. Uh, own Sock Alexis at least. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting and curious, you know, aspect of it. You know, they've they mentioned him in in, in her the Cleveland's program guide, like the press notes, mm -hmm. um, for many years was you know he would be one a notable player in there, and they mentioned a little bit of the story, and it was just very, but it was very footnoted. Um, there's a picture of him um, at Progressive Field in you know one of the sections just kind of on the wall as a, as a small thing. But it, it wasn't really like, 
they never really acknowledged the tie to it. I think part of it was that the for a long time his name inspiring the team name was debated a lot and a lot of people thought that oh it, w it wasn't really him who inspired the name it was really the Boston Braves had just become a team and and that that became really popular around the same time and but it, it if you look at the historical record it really was the the writers who came up with the name and they really did mention him specifically as the as the inspiration but I think the team just didn't really want it you know if you really looked at the history and you really looked the, at the way he was treated, then the story gets a little muddy. I think they, it wasn't quite as heroic as, as maybe they, they could have made it out to be. So both of your films sort of, you know, it only sort of exposes sort of our own sort of ignorant underbelly sometimes as a society. And Lance, you included, look, you included a clip from Major League, the movie, and here's a movie that I, I love. And, I, and you put that moment in there, and you're like, oh my god, I feel like a, I feel horrible for, like in the movie, it's a bad scene. Um, it is amazing how, I mean, this is why I love, do, love what we do here at these film festivals, is to surface this, because I know I feel worse, <laughs> but I feel better today, and, and a little less ignorant, but... I mean, it is it is astonishing that both films sort of only. I, I just think like, I take your film, Frank. I grew up in Miami, and uh, Latino football players could never get, were never true. You know, you're supposed to play baseball. And if you were a Cuban and you wanted to play football, the the coaches would like, no, 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 you're supposed to play baseball. And they saw this, and it's just made me think how much are. How many people have we been doing this to for decades? You know, I think it's like the internal and external pressure that people feel, right? I, I talk about the night, the 38 night a lot in my own personal life. I was trying to get in the game and I couldn't. So I go to Koreatown, go to one of the bars and uh, you had two hours of people who look like me just losing their minds. And I was just watching people do that and I'm like, that's gotta be a combination of external pressure from society telling you those things. This is what you should be, this is what you shouldn't be. And then internal family pressure. You know, like a lot of, I had to play a lot of violin and piano kids. You know, like let's be real. And I, might, I didn't get to play basketball, right? I never got to play sports. So like, it, at least for, for I think in this particular ex uh, example, it was a combination of societal expectations, family pressures, and then you create this cauldron that people just haven't really tapped into um, until you have an experience like Linsanity. And I think, you know, I, look, I, I've obviously been obsessed with this story for a decade, but I, I sort of kept it to myself, I'll be honest with you. Um, it wasn't until, I hadn't talked about it for years until I had a conversation with um, one of the producers of the movie, Trayvon Free, about like what is an impossible moment. The society tells you you can't do something and somebody comes out of nowhere and shatters it, right? And it was actually done in the context of talking about the original impossible moment for all of us, which is Obama, right? Like what feeling feels like Obama? I'm like, the only one that feels like that for me is Linsanity. And I think that's probably like, that's a great description of the power of stereotypes in our society. Um, but it does, you know, sometimes it takes 10 years. Um, sometimes it takes certain people to come to a realization of like, you know, the power and the weight of the story in order for us to have a full conversation about it. But I think we're there and we're, we're ready to have that conversation about Lansanity, which is, which is a good thing. Lance, what's your sense of why it's taken our society so long to reconcile how poorly we treated Native Americans and have? especially with the story. I mean, you think about it, other, other groups, we, we sort of stopped stereotyping as badly before we, before we did Native Americans. Well, you know, I, I, I think when it comes to, I can really only speak about what I know about the team name, you know. I, um, I think that there's a certain reverence to history in the in the case of the team name, um, and there's also 
a sense that, um, you know, sometimes history is too, too adhered to in a certain way. Um, in, in the case of the team name, I think people were really clinging to it because of, because of what it represented all those years ago without seeing how things have changed and how things have evolved. Um, and I think that, you know, um, American history is complicated and ba baseball's tied up right in it with, with all of it, you know, and that's I guess what's what was striking about. about your film is how much of the racism came from the media. Yeah, It absolutely. was baseball writers that did this. Yeah. Look, baseball writers, it, it, you know, Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were always talked, were always described as being ornery. Well, they were only described being ornery by white baseball writers yeah. in the 60s who were covering them. It is amazing how sports writers can, can create a stereotype. And they certainly seem to play a huge role here, no? Yeah, they did. I mean, it, in a lot of ways, you know, you have to think about where America was at that time, too, with, in, mentioned in the film with the Wild West shows and so forth. And um, there were, it was very much sort of culturally in the air. And so when the, the, the writers really seized upon that as a way to kind of make the poetry of it. And, and mm -hmm. baseball writing was very Baroque. It was very, um, you know... It, it had this very flowery style, and it's because there was no television, and the, the writers right. had to sort of really make up these crazy stories and and use as, as much kind of turgid prose as they could, and and they so they really grabbed onto that and and used that in a way that was you know in retrospect pretty cringy, um, and this was you know it, it, it you know this would they they would do you know as a way to kind of create an audience, but but mm -hmm. certainly it perpetuated that stereotype and. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting to see, to to see the the Jeremy Lin film after this because it felt like, you know, Sock Alexis could have had his own moment like that in the early, you know, the early part of eighteen. Well, imagine if there were film and you heard the crack of the bat yeah, against the I mean, pitcher, right? You know, here he is against the guy who throws the hardest, and and if you'd seen it, yeah, it would have been a moment like that, I right. think. Um, and and the, a lot of the tragedy of it is is because of the time it took place. How many other Native Americans tried to make it into Major League Baseball? Well, there are back some. Then. Oh, back back, then. back yeah. then he was he was an anomaly, an absolute anomaly for a, for a very long time. Um, there was yeah, no one no one had been. There was a couple players before him that had some mm -hmm. sort of connections, but they weren't. They were white passing and did not. It was never mentioned in their lifetime that. that so he was really really one of a kind um, for a really long time. Um, and of course, there are you know players today that that are, right. um, but um, but yeah, he was he very. It, it's it's you know he, he was really his fame didn't kind. spark more younger members of whether it's his tribe or other tribes to. I mean, you know, at the end of the film, you see he goes back and and teaches right. um, to to some people in his community, and I think he he did he definitely inspired a lot of people, a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of um, indigenous people within sports. But it, but you know, it's it, as a baseball thing. They were still very much, you know, they're not really. This was before they they um, they actually, you know, Major League Baseball came out and, and created the color barrier. It wasn't right. just like, right. you know, it, it was a, it was a law really that that came down and said we're not we're actually going to stop now. Um, and that was even before that. So like I think by the time the people who had been inspired by him were ready to play. Yeah. Baseball had already implemented its, you know. Frank, are you confident that if somebody looks like Jeremy Lin is the player of the year in high school in California, they're going to get a scholarship offer now or not? Yes. Um, I, I do think that that is uh, in the ether, right? Uh, and I, I do think that there are, like, it's not, you know, there's a great player um, on the Cleveland Guardians now, Stephen Kwan. Right, he just won a gold glove. Yeah. Like, I don't think anybody really blinked, right? Um, you know, there was an NFL kicker who just kicked a game-winning field goal for the Falcons like a couple weeks ago. He's been in the league three or four yeah. years, actually. Like, yeah. people, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it, I think it had the seal has been broken, which I'm glad that's the case because I rather not. You know, like yeah. I rather it be the first time, and then like we do normalize it from here. Um, I think. You know, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't like. I think sports are a great sort of like litigator for a lot of the issues that we have 
you know, in society in general, right? Well, there's a little meritocracy that's supposed to go as <laughs> Exactly. It doesn't always happen, but the, right. the, you have a better shot needs. of it. Yeah, it exactly. In. Um, and I, I think that um, it is, in my opinion, just from, a, from an Asian American perspective, like, because of the specific stereotypes that are lobbed onto Asian Americans as being weak and submissive, not taking the final shot, right? Like, the role of sports, the role that Jeremy specifically had and his story has in breaking that specific stereotype, I think can't be uh, understated. Like, it really, I'm glad that the movie now has sort of made that point to people, um, but that, I think, has been missing in the conversation until now. We got a, a, only a, a couple minutes. You had the luxury of film. Yeah. You had clips. You had highlights. Yeah. You did not. Yeah. Um, what you obviously overcame it. You did a little bit of reenactment, a little bit of drawing. What what was uh, what were some of the choices? Yeah, that, the, that, it was very challenging. I mean, there's yeah. only like six photographs of him that exist. So that was a big hurdle going into it. I knew from the beginning was. How can we make this story feel alive, relevant, exciting as much as we can, knowing it took place the bulk of it in 1897 and there's just very little material uh, to do that. So, you know, yes, we used some of the, the drawings and the, and the newspaper articles. We did a little bit of recreation um, and, and using as much of the photographs as we could. But, you know, we also brought to life some of, you know, there's, again, there's only a couple interviews with him. Um, that were ever done in his lifetime. And we took as much, almost all the text from it uh, and had that uh, recreated to give him a voice and to have uh, him have some kind of voice in the film because it was important to me. We're talking a lot about him, but we really you know, never got to know him as a man. You know, again, one of the tragedies um, uh, of his career was that we never really got to understood what was going through his mind in those moments and how he reacted and how he really God forbid felt. a sports writer interviewed him. Yeah, I mean, his, what, that interview yeah. that you see, you know, that, that there's excerpts from, like, one of those was done from jail, actually. Um, wow. the, the, you know, it was later in his career, and, and, a, and a, uh, a local reporter learned that he was being held, and, and sh oh, that, that's the old famous player, Sock Lexus, and showed up and interviewed him um, from his jail cell, which is, again, right. horribly tragic to know, but... but Again, yeah, that's that's the only time he he got to speak, and and even then he's just being very effusive and kind and and gregarious and tr and painting it all in as a good a light as he can, even though you know he probably somewhere it. in here, yeah, in 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 him there was more to yeah. say, you know, and I think I wish we could know all the other things that were going through his mind and and really understand his story deeply in that way, but but I, we can't. I get the sense Frank Jeremy's still holding some stuff back. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think um, he doesn't talk about. He talks about some of the ways players treated him. Yeah, uh, and like but I'm guessing, there's probably some. Well, you know, it's funny. I ha we have got a lot of comments being like, "Well, you know, it doesn't cover how old insanity ended in New York. It doesn't cover their, his whole career." I'm like, it doesn't, right? But <laughs> that's I think called a short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's a directorial choice that I made to focus on that, so I could draw out to the larger community, right? Um, but there's a lot of ground to cover, and I think, you know, this is one of the lessons of learning someone as a human being instead of a symbol, right? Like, yep. people got to, they got to go at this at their own speed, you know? Um, we got to wrap up. What are you working on next, if you don't mind sharing, Lance? Um, I also do fiction film, so I'm, I'm going to be making a fiction film next year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Congratulations on that. And Frank, what are you working on? I'm um, pitching a lot of different series <laughs> and projects that fit like this. So stay tuned. So anybody taking pitches, right? <laughs> anyway, congratulations to both of you. Thank Another you. round of Thank applause you. for Appreciate Lance it. and Frank. Thanks for uh,